I'm very thankful that you're here tonight. Thank you for coming, being part of this midweek Bible study to encourage each other to study God's Word together, uh, just in, <clears throat> in fellowship with one another, uh, and just uh, gain a, a, a sense of calm and peace uh, in the middle of a work week. So I hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, tonight starts our summer series that's entitled Follow Me. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of where this, where this came from, other than just the scripture, because that's where it does, is that Jesus offers many invitations throughout his ministry, but none greater than when he sells individuals or crowds to follow me. And I thought that we would use the summer months of July and August to look at following Jesus, that we are his disciples, that we would follow him as the rabbis would say, that we would follow so close to our teacher that we would be covered in the dust that he walks in. Uh, tonight, our first uh, speaker is going to be our brother Monty Hampton. He is uh, the minister at the Fuquay Verena Church of Christ. He's also a shepherd there. He's been there for over 25 years. I know he's not a stranger to many of us. He has spoken every year that I've been here uh, with you, and I know that he has spoken before that as well. So I know uh, that we look forward to having him speak to us. He and his wife have been blessed with three children and seven grandchildren. So I know that he mentions and counts himself among many of us as blessed and very fortunate. So tonight, as you can tell by the title on the screen, he's going to talk to us tonight about following Jesus into the water. Money. All right. Good to be with you all tonight. Uh, once again, um, as Elijah said, um, I've been here a few times before and uh, I don't get to get to know you that uh, that much because we're here for about an hour and then we're gone. Uh, but um, I know several people here and um, I, I really uh, cherish the, uh, the opportunity to come be with you all again and to, to share in God's word and just uh, pray that, that uh, something will be said tonight um, that will be helpful to you. Uh, my prayers every time I preach are, Lord, help me to just be faithful to the scripture and use, use it to uplift or convict or encourage um, my brethren as, uh, or, or somebody else in the audience. Uh, maybe that, that's yet to know Jesus. So I've been given this as the, the topic, um, as my topic, um, following Jesus into the water. And the text we're going to use tonight uh, mainly is Matthew 3, 13 through 17. We're actually going to go all over the Bible. We're going to kind of do a, a, a quick bird's eye view of much of the Bible uh, as we try to contextualize some of the things Jesus says in Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Uh, I want to start by reading that text. Um, wow. 59 year old eyeballs <clears throat> then jesus came from galilee this is matthew 3 13 then jesus came from galilee to the jordan to john to be baptized by him john would have prevented him saying i need to be baptized by you and do you come to me but jesus answered him let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness then he consented and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. All right, so I want to ask two questions that are suggested by this text tonight. There'll be two questions that we talk about in this sermon. It's going to be sort of asymmetrical. We'll talk more, much more, uh, spend more time on the first one than we do the second one. But we really can't ask the second question until we uh, adequately address the first one. The questions are, why did Jesus go into the water? That's question one. And question two is, why should we follow him there? All right. In other words, what is the biblical significance of Christ's baptism? And what then is the biblical significance of a human being's baptism, of our baptism, of somebody being baptized into Christ? What can we say about this from this text? So let's first of all look at the, uh, the, the question, why did Jesus go into the water? What's the meaning? What's the significance of the baptism of Christ? Now, in the text, in Matthew 3, verse 15, it says that his baptism was to fulfill all righteousness. John resists, you know, who am I to baptize you? You should be baptizing me. And Jesus' answer, his, re his re reply is, no, it's fitting. 
it's proper, it's appropriate for us to do this because it will fulfill all righteousness. His baptism would in some way fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? I think that's, whatever that means is the answer to the question why Jesus went into the water. That's what he says, right? Now, <clears throat> this cannot mean to make him righteous in the sense, uh, you know, in, in a moral sense or an ethical sense, because that would imply that he was unrighteous. Um, we know that our baptism into Christ is, uh, among other things, for remission of sins. Acts 2.38 says so. Um, but we read in Hebrews 4.15 and elsewhere that Jesus was without sin, utterly without sin. The only one to ever live on this earth who was. So if there's anything that Christ's baptism was not for, it was not for the remission of sins. At least not his own, right? He has none to, to be remitted. So to understand this phrase, to fulfill all righteousness, we need to look more closely at the way that Matthew, in his gospel, uses a couple of terms. The first of which is the term righteousness. Matthew uses the Greek word translated righteousness, in at least most of our English Bible, seven times in his gospel. And in every case, Matthew is using it in a behavioral sense. Um, sort of like the conduct that God requires of his people. That's righteousness. Or compliance with the will of God. That's, for Matthew, what righteousness appears to mean in all the cases where he uses it. So the sense here would be, however inappropriate it may seem for John the Baptist to baptize Jesus, however backwards that might seem, Christ's baptism actually is necessary to complete the will of God. It's righteous in the sense that it will comply with the purpose of God for Jesus. The second term that we need to uh, look at in a little more detail is the word fulfill. Jesus answered, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And I have the Greek word there that it comes from. It's the word plerao. This is used 10 times in Matthew's gospel. And there's a very important caveat here that we need to uh, keep in mind that I want to be really clear about. We talk a lot in our culture, especially in the evangelical world of the modern West, about prophecy fulfillment. There's whole theologies and denominations that are just, they, 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 they major in prophecy fulfillment. And typically what most people nowadays, at least in our part of the world, uh, who are theologically conservative in, on any level, think when they hear the word prophecy or fulfillment, they're thinking of like some predicted detail, some empirically verifiable detail that later happens and you go, boom, see the word of God was true. That's not generally what this word means in Matthew's gospel. Now, does it sometimes? Yes. Um, one case would be, uh, and you may be, be thinking about this one already, in Matthew 2, a chapter earlier, Matthew says that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem like Micah said. All right, that's kind of an empirically, you know, falsifiable, detailed, discrete kind of data point, right? That's what we think all prophecy is very often, and it's just typically not the way Matthew uses this word fulfill. If you go into Matthew's gospel thinking every time I see the word something in the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus, it's going to turn your brain in circles. If, if, you, you already know what I mean if, if you know what I mean. You'll see in a second. You'll go, oh, yeah, I've, I've wondered about that before. All right, so let me be more specific. Fulfillment, to doing something to fulfill something that, that the Old Testament spoke of for the gospel of Matthew most of the time, is talking much more about a pattern of Old Testament history or a pattern of Old Testament language, a sequence of events that happened sometimes once, most usually several times over in different historical moments as time went by. And something about what Jesus is doing or saying replicates that pattern, but in a fuller sense, in the fullest sense. It consummates it, it completes it, it fills it out. Let me give you an example. Um, just to show you that the word plerao, the one on the screen here, fulfill, uh, what it basically means is it's non-metaphorical kind of literal meaning is just to fill something up. Okay, so it's used that way actually. Very literally here in Matthew 3, 47 and 48, where Jesus says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind when it was full. You could legitimately translate that when it was fulfilled. It's the exact same Greek word. But we know that that's not what it's saying here, is it? The net's fulfilled. Yeah, it's fulfilled. It's got all the fish I caught in it, you know. Um, but he just says full, because that's the basic meaning of the word plerao, 
that's translated in our English Bibles, fulfill. Okay? Matthew, though, typically doesn't use it this way. More often, he uses it metaphorically of some pattern of events or some thematic development in the life of Christ that fills up or fills out, you might even say, a pattern or a theme or an image or a sequence laid down in, in, in the previous Old Testament scriptures, in an, in an earlier narrative in the Bible. And Jesus, in some way, is the full coming into being of something that Scripture was always pointing to, but back then it was only in a less filled out or filled up form. And now Jesus is filling it up to the fullest. He's, he's completing it. You see what I'm saying? Um, an example. Let me give you an, an analogy first. That I, I, this is my own analogy out of my own brain. I, I don't know how well it works. And then we're going to look at a couple of examples. If, if you saw a picture of me when I was 12 years old, had I brought one, my mom has some, she lives across the street from us. She's 85 years old. She's got a lot of little pictures, you know, faded little pictures of, of the family. And, and I brought that in here and, and, and you put it next to me. You may or may not know that's me. Everybody who knew me and watched me grow up, though, would have no doubt. Hair color was different, you know, for one thing. But that was me at 12. This is me now. Same person just filled up and filled out. A little more filled out than I want to be, actually, you know. But it's, it's the same person, but it's just the completed version, the adult version, the perfected version. Let me give you a couple examples from this in Matthew's gospel. So if you look at, for instance, uh, Matthew 2, 13 through 15, we'll, we'll see this word fulfill used again. And I think this will really illustrate how Matthew uses this word fulfill. And it's different from the way we typically think of fulfill, fulfillment of prophecy. Though it's typical, actually, in Matthew's gospel. It's the norm, not the exception. So this is Matthew 2, 13. He says, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child. This is the baby Jesus, the infant Jesus and his mother and flee to Egypt. Remember this and remain there until I tell you for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Notice it. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. So it looks on the surface like, well, Hosea said way back when in Hosea 11, this is just a direct quote from Hosea 11, 1. He said way back when that Jesus was going to come up out of Egypt. Until you go read Hosea 11, 1. And you're like, that's not what that's talking about. No Jew on earth would have thought that was talking about the coming Christ in the future for one reason, it's not talking about the future. It's talking about the past. Let me show you. This is the text that's quoted. Hosea 11, 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Wait, when Israel was a child, that's past tense. Looking back in Israelite history, he's talking about Israel's apostasy here and God's patience. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Remember that they, they coalesced into a nation uh, through the Exodus, a, a nation of slaves that goes to Mount Sinai and gets Torah and, and um, God gives a covenant with them and they have a tabernacle and the whole relationship starts. But he's saying, I loved Israel before that. The more they were called, though, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to these idols. They kept burn, uh, burning these offerings to idols. And yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took little bitty baby Israel by the hand and nurtured him. But they didn't know that it was I was healing. It just goes on to talk about, you know, how, how unfaithful they've been, even though their whole history before this point, since he called them up out of Egypt, his son out of Egypt, um, was, was out of the grace of God. So how is it that something that in Hosea 11, 1 is looking backward in time can be fulfilled at a future point in, 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 you know, in, the, in, the, uh, in the distant future by Jesus? Well, it's because it's not talking about, I said this is going to happen, and it did. It's talking about a pattern that Jesus then replicates. Like many famous Hebrew people, he goes into Egypt and comes up out of Egypt. It's a biblical narrative. It's a motif. It's a, a sequence that happens as a pattern over and over and over again. One more example, then we'll move on. In Matthew 1, the angel, if you recall, tells Joseph that Mary's virgin birth of a son who would be named the Emmanuel will, quote, fulfill Isaiah 7, 14. But if you go read Isaiah 7, 14, 
You remember the original context? It has nothing to do with the coming Messiah or with the distant future at all. In fact, what's going on there is King Ahaz of Judah is very worried because the king of Israel and the king of Syria have banded together and they're about to, there's an imminent attack on Judah and Ahaz is losing his mind in anxiety. And God says, simmer down, basically, this is paraphrase. Um, a son is going to be born to a virgin and before that little boy even becomes of age, old enough to know right and wrong, that threat is going to be vaporized. Don't worry about it. Well, that's the future, but it's a future of about 10 years, not millennia or, you know, centuries, right? So this is what Matthew does typically over and over and over again. In fact, it's been noted before that the early career of Jesus, Matthew 1 through Matthew 7 at least, at least through the end of the Sermon on the Mount, exactly parallels, parallels Israelite history. He just replicates Israelite history. You know? Um, and we won't go into that now. But for Matthew, suffice it to say that to fulfill something from the Old Testament is to flesh out the earlier pattern often a recurring narrative or thematic pattern in the Old Testament, but now in its fullest sense, in its consummate sense, in Jesus. So that raises the question for us, now we're going back to the statement, the baptism is to fulfill all righteousness. What older biblical patterns then, what themes or images from the Old Testament did Jesus' baptism in the waters of the Jordan flesh out, fill out, or fill up in some ultimate consummation? When Jesus was baptized, Matthew 3, 16 says, Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven saying, or said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What older biblical patterns in previous scriptural narrative did Jesus' baptism in the waters of the Jordan bring to some ultimate consummation? Well, it turns out, that water plays a very significant role in key narratives in biblical history. All right? Water isn't just a Church of Christ thing. Water baptism. Um, so one thing I want you to think about too, this really isn't in my notes, but it, I grew up in, in, a, in a Church of Christ and we talked about patterns so many times. But what we meant by pattern was Almost like it's just an atomistic cherry picking of, this is what I got anyway. I don't know if this is what the older people are trying to tell me. This is what my little brain got. You go there, they did that, okay. They did that. They did those five things for this. They did those 12 things for that. And you, it, that's the pattern. It was, it was kind of a thin patternism. It wasn't, there wasn't a lot of depth to it. It was just, they did that then. Boom. So we need to do it. It wasn't like story or reasons or narrative. It was a kind of a thinner, shallower kind of patternism. But we were not wrong, we, quote unquote, anybody who noticed the, the prevalence of water in the Bible story. It's all over the place. And I want to give some credit right here because some of the things I'm going to be saying for the next few points, I'm drawing heavily on a guy named Tim Mackey, who does some of the Bible Project um, stuff online, which is, in my view, mostly excellent, at least the stuff I've heard. So I, I want to just give credit. I got some of these insights from him. All right, let's go back to creation then. We're going to look at water real briefly, like a quick survey of water in some key narrative, uh, at some key narrative junctures in Old Testament history. So this is creation, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So creation of everything, the heavens and the earth, begins with all creation as an unformed or disordered uh, something, and it's also, there's two things it says about it. It's unformed, so it's kind of chaotic, it's not ordered. And the second thing is it's void of life. Okay? So it's empty, and it's chaotic, without form, and void. Instead, we have darkness. Darkness was over the face of the deep. So, to sum it up, that's kind of a watery chaos. I don't know what that means or what it looked like you know, physically and all. Who knows? But that, let's just take the language seriously. It's described as a watery chaos, a dark, watery chaos. But note what else was present at this watery chaos. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This word is a very important one. The Hebrew word ruach 
which is translated in the Old Testament variously as spirit, like the spirit of God is the ruach of God. Sometimes it's wind, a wind that God brings, the breath of God. It's a lot like the New Testament word pneuma, which can be spirit, breath, wind, same thing, same kind of semantic range. The wind or breath or spirit of God is hovering over that watery, chaotic deep. All right? And this spirit, together with God's own voice or the word of God, is what brings creative order out of this chaos. And God said, Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. There was darkness. Now his voice with his spirit, those are the only two things we're given as agents that make this happen. Spirit of God is there and he speaks, right? He says, let there be light. There was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. So the, the number one thing that was sort of wrong was that there was darkness everywhere and water everywhere. And it was, and it was, it was formless because of that and empty of life, void. Well, now the spirit of God and the word of God has spoken into that watery chaos and I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice that God's means of creating is through what the Genesis text calls separating. Look at all the times there in the red where he uses separate. Uh, God separated the light from the darkness. He separated the waters from the, wa the water above the earth from the waters below the earth with the, the firmament, the expanse. Um, he separates the water on the earth bet between the, you know, the, the part above and the part below from dry land and seas. So there's, there's three separations going on here. God is dividing or separating, and that's the verb that's used for him creating order where there was chaos, okay? God has pushed back the chaos. He separated uh, water from dryness and brought order where there was disorder. He's opened up a space in the world for life, for human flourishing. And what does he call it? Good. At the end of every day, it is good, it is good, it is good. When he creates humanity, he says it's very good. All right? But, you know the rest of the story. Corruption, human corruption, human violence results in bringing all of that chaos back. And so we have to talk about the flood, Genesis 6 through 9. And the flood is presented in the biblical narrative here as a kind of decreation. And then a recreation. Why do I say that? Well, decreation because the waters that had been separated to create habitable space for humans now come crashing back together. That's the very thing that happens to wipe out everything. The waters were separate. Now they're not anymore. Remember the heavens, the windows of the heavens are opened and the springs of the deep are um, split open. So you've got a, a, a water coming back from above and from below doing the exact reverse of what it says God did to, to create order and, and keep the chaos back for human thriving. That's decreation. And so once again, the earth is in chaos. It is devoid of life. In Genesis 7, we read the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth. Water was the problem at the beginning. That's what creation spoke into. The mountains now are all covered. Verse 22, everything on the dry land Remember the days of creation? The dry land being made is a big deal. You don't get life, on, land life until that. Well, now all of that's covered in water and everything that had the breath of life in it that was on dry land is dead. But God isn't done with humanity and he's not done with his creation. In chapter 8, verse 1 of Genesis, we read, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And notice this, God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. Anybody want to guess what the word there for wind is? The exact same word that was hovering over the earth at the beginning to create creation in the beginning. To, to push the chaos back. To bring light where there was darkness and dry habitable space for life, for human life especially, where there was water. And that's exactly the agent that dries the earth again. So the flood in every way is described as a decreation, sort of the anti-creation, and then a recreation. And in fact, right after this, um, we get statements like the waters were dried off the earth and the ground was dry. That evokes the creation days of Genesis 1. 
And especially this. Remember the first thing God says to human beings in the whole Bible? Genesis 1.28. The very first thing said to human beings. And about him, what we're here for, is that we're, you know, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and so on. That's what he says again. Right as they're about to come out of the ark and start over, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. It's that creation mandate all over again. The human charge, God gives it to them again. So this is a, a decreation and then a recreation. That's the, the language or the, 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 the images, the motifs that, that the inspired writer is using to tell us about these things. All right, let's fast forward now to the Exodus. God's people are suffering in a kind of chaos. The chaos of Egyptian bondage. Just as the dark, formless world of Genesis 1 was no place for life, neither is the Israelites' existence in Egypt very life-giving at all. This is the furthest thing from Shalom. In despair, they cry out, and God hears them. And he sends Moses to Pharaoh, and Moses says, let my people go. But what's interesting for our purposes, and we're going to see much the same pattern of, of, of narrative elements in the Exodus that we saw in the creation and the flood. Um, it, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if it's a very good analogy or not. It's kind of like a riff in, in pop music. You know what a riff is? Or I had to look this word up because I don't know much about classical. Ostinato in classical. So you have some um, recurring progression of chords or notes. That, that pops up at different points in the song. The song may go all over the place, but that's kind of the theme. It lets you know, oh, that's kind of this song's tune or signature riff. I could give you some examples, but they would all be from like rock music that I don't really want you to know that I listened to in earlier days. But um, anyway, um, and, and those riffs or ostinatos give a kind of unity to the piece of music in the same way that riffs in the narrative give a unity to the Bible story. It makes it more memorable, too. Again, with the Exodus, it's a separating of waters that is, is God's means of giving his people life. So in Exodus 14, we read this. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. That's Genesis 1 language. And they went, uh, and the waters were divided. There's more Genesis. It's like separating and dividing. That's what God does. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Okay? So I want you to notice the resonances here with the narrative pattern of creation and flood. The waters are divided to make dry land as a way to support human life. It, it closes back in on the Egyptians, right? Like it's the flood. But for the Israelites, it's almost like creation. I'm separating waters and giving you dry land. You can, you can live. You can survive. You can thrive. Not the folks who are pursuing, pursuing you. Okay? Um, not only that, notice by what agency. Anybody notice it? It was a strong east wind. A ruach. The enemy's water. Water separating people. It's not the cusp of death and life, darkness and light, dying and thriving, chaos and order, life-giving order. God's spirit, his ruach, his wind is what brings this about again. All right. Now, with all that in the background, we could go on and on, right? We could, we could talk about the waters of the Jordan River, how they're walled off to form dry land as Israelites go into the promised land. And in each of these instances... Of, of this pattern. The point isn't that each scene is identical. No, it's, it's each instance is going to tailor and interpret the pattern in slightly different ways to fit different historical, you know, new historical situations. That's why I say it's sort of like, it's sort of like a riff and then maybe an improvisation, you know, in jazz. You still have to be true to the chords of the song. You can't just go off into la la land, but you, you've got some room to improvise. And I know that's not a perfect analogy, but it's staying true to the song's chord progression but there's a new twist for a different part of the song. And there's new twists with each new historical development. But it's still that same pattern of events. Now, what does this have to do with Jesus' baptism? Somehow it fulfills or fleshes out things that went before. And, and, it, and it complies with the will of God for Jesus. It fulfills all righteousness. 
This, the baptism of Jesus brings the biblical pattern of water deliverance, deliverance from and through water, to ultimate fulfillment. Jesus then came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Matthew 3, 13. Verse 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. So Jesus has gone himself into the waters, which stood in so many biblical stories previous to this, at the cusp between, you know, the borderline between death and life, darkness and light, and Jesus is immersed in those waters. And then instead of the waters separating, as at creation or the Red Sea or the Jordan River, this time we read, the heavens separate. And behold, right upon his baptism, the heavens were opened. Your, your version may say separated or torn. Those are all fair translations of this verb. As if to say, God is now tearing open the barrier between heaven and earth to deal at last with the problem of sin and death once and for all. There's a great passage in Isaiah 64, 1, where the, the prophet just says, kind of in exasperation, just cries out to God. It's almost like an, a, a lament. He says, oh, that you, speaking to Yahweh, oh, that you would rend or rip or tear the heavens open and come down. You ever felt like that? I've had enough. Just tear the heavens open. Come down here. That's what he's saying. And that word for, oh, that you would rend or tear the heavens open is the identical word. If you go back to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, they use the same verb that's used here in the baptism of Jesus. It's like the baptism of Jesus is an answer, at least the beginning of an answer to this cry in Isaiah 64, 1, tear the heavens open and come save us. Jesus is immersed in water of all things and the heavens open. As if God's saying, deal. The Spirit of God. Is that any shock now? The Spirit of God descends like a dove and comes to rest on him. That evokes Genesis 1, the Spirit of God brooding or hovering over the dark waters. Right? Right? bringing creation out of chaos, or the wind of God at the Exodus drying up the waters or walling back the waters, or the wind of God drying up the waters after the flood so the, the creation could start anew, if you will. And there's this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We don't have time to go into that. That evokes a lot of stuff about the suffering servant and the latter part of Isaiah and all that. So we have to leave that there. All right. I haven't left myself much time, but second question. We won't spend as much time on this one. But we, we had to get that backdrop because Matthew's all about Jesus being, he's fulfilling Israelite history. That's the point of Matthew. He's, he's kind of saying, here's what God always meant. That's the consummate Israelite right there. And his, his own biography replicates. It sort of, you know, uh, redoes the, the history of Israel. But, but what about our baptism? It's one thing to say Jesus went into the water. Should we follow Christ into the water? Should we do what he did? What's the meaning or significance when a human being is baptized? Well, let me say, first of all, as Elijah said, the whole point of this series is Matthew over and over and over and over again says, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Excellent. It's perfect for a series like this because he just has so many times. And they all have different contexts. You can do different sermons, right? So... Many times in Matthew, just some examples. He, he tells Peter and Andrew in Matthew 4, 19, follow me. Remember the guy in Matthew 8? Jesus says, follow me. And he goes, but first of all, I've got to bury the dead. And he goes, let the dead bury their own dead. You be serious about this. Or Matthew himself, the tax collector. Jesus walks by and says, follow me. Gets a lot of heat from all the religious people because they're not really into that kind of thing. Um, Jesus is. Should this general appeal to follow me that we see so often in the Gospel of Matthew, should that include following Jesus into the waters of baptism? I think the answer is yes. Now, why? Why do we say that? Why should we follow him into the waters of baptism? Well, Christian baptism allows human beings to participate 
in Christ's victory over death and darkness. To participate in his deliverance from chaos and destruction into life and new creation. Just like after the flood. Remember what Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. That's your new reality. And there, there are passages which suggest all these things about water uh, and deliverance. One of them is 1 Corinthians 10, which is exceedingly interesting for several, on several fronts. He's writing to a largely Gentile church. Corinth was people by a lot of uh, Roman soldier vets, uh, freemen who'd gotten their freemen and now are getting a little purchase of land in Corinth. And he, but he says this, I don't want you to be unaware, 1 Corinthians 10, 1, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He calls the Hebrew patriarchs, the Hebrew fathers, fathers of Gentile Christians, which tells us, a side lesson, we should never de-Judaize Jesus and try to make him be something other than, I mean, there's a reason we have the Old Testament. He is the Jewish Messiah. It just turns out that, you know, Israel's God happens to be the, the world's God, the one true God, the only true God. And Jesus is his exact image, as the New Testament will argue. So what I want you to notice here is what we haven't read. He equates their passing through the Red Sea with Christian baptism. An inspired writer does that. To Corinthian Christians. Boy, how far away were they from ancient Israel and, you know, the, the Reed Sea or the Red Sea that the Israelites went through? This is like a different part of the world. Different culture. This is Hellenistic stuff. And yet he's, he's saying, I'm plugging you right into that Hebrew story. And, and when you're baptized, you are replicating this pattern when God delivered his people through and by water at the Red Sea. In both cases, going into the waters took them from slavery to freedom. When somebody says to you, baptism isn't necessary, I would ask them this question. How well would Israel, the Israelites have fared had they stayed on the close bank and not proceeded to the far bank of the Red Sea? That bank they were on, remember, was death. It was slavery. The far bank was freedom and life and promised land. 1 Peter 3. God's patience waited in the day of Noah, days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. So he's drawing the connection between Christian baptism and the recreation, the new life that came about when the old creation was kind of wiped clean and creation's replicated with a new chance, a new start in the same language that Genesis 1 has used. And now he's applying that to us, to human, to individuals. Your life, my little life. Wow. This cosmic history applies to me. Isn't that crazy? God's going to do the same kind of operation on you and me that he did with the world, the cosmos. And throughout, you know, very significant history. We don't have time to go into all the other examples, but I'll mention a couple just by way of suggestion. In Romans 6, talking about baptism, Paul says that it frees us from slavery. That's the, the word he uses. Slavery to sin. Maybe they're invoking the slavery in Egypt that the Exodus freed the Israelites from. What about John 3? What does it mean when Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and says, hey, you know, I, I, you're really great. And Jesus says, whatever. Except a human being is born again. Born spiritually, born anew, born afresh, born from above. He, one, cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus is confused, understandably, and says, what do you mean? I'm an old guy. How do I go back into my mother's womb? He's thinking biology, right? You know, anatomy and, and, and all that. And, and, and Jesus says, no, no, no. We're talking about a different kind of birth. A birth of what? Two elements. Water and the spirit. I just can't believe that's an accident. I can't believe that's talking about some random other usage of when that's always been the things. It doesn't overtly make that point, but it sure does. The, the Bible narrative suggests that taken as a whole. Okay, so to kind of angle toward home now, where do you and I, where do all human beings fit into all of this? Let's ask the so what question. 
Well, isn't Matthew's gospel inviting us as readers to ask ourselves that question? Where, where do we fit into the story of Jesus and the story of the larger biblical narrative that he brings to a conclusion, to a consummation? Where do we fit into that? It's hardly insignificant that Matthew's gospel has baptism as the very first and the very last thing Jesus says. Have you ever noticed that? The first thing he says is the thing we read tonight. He comes to John the Baptist and said, hey, I need you to baptize me. What's the last thing Jesus says recorded in Matthew? The Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I sometimes think that in my own religious theological heritage, I'm, I'm very thankful for the insights that I receive, but I sometimes think, I hope this doesn't sound snooty or arrogant, that we were more right than we even knew, which kind of made us not as right as we thought we were, if that makes any sense. Like it was a lot heavier and deeper than we even, we, we were onto something, I'm not sure we knew. And, and, and probably a lot of people, did, I, didn't, I didn't, my little brain didn't get it in Arkansas growing up. I just thought you just go through and they did that. We do that. That's it. We follow the pattern. We are obedient robots. The Bible isn't written that way. It's not a bunch of independent standalone propositions that just fell out of heaven. It's narratives mostly. And yeah, there's things we're told to do. There's propositions here and there, but it's mostly in a narrative form. And that's just a point of data. That's just the way it comes to us. Um, you ever notice that the law you know, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the law, it's called the law all over the Bible, the Torah. The whole first book of the Torah, which is the law, it's 50 something chapters, Genesis, I forgot how, off the top of my head, 50 at least, maybe 50 something, whatever, gigantic book, first book of the law. How many laws are in Genesis? Are there any? It's a story. It's a story we're to live out of though. A story can be normative too, especially for people whose hearts are in it. You don't have to be like, do this or do that or don't do that or what if a story compels my heart? And, and that's what I think I mean here when I say we were more right, we, I'm using that very accommodative, I hope you understand and give me some grace on that. Um, but it's my own heritage, so uh, I think I can do this. It, it's a lot, the pattern is, we, we have a pattern to follow, but it's a lot more robust. It's a thicker pattern. It's the pattern of the whole Bible. Right? So somebody says, I don't need to be baptized. They're not just violating Acts 2.38. They're kind of going against the warp and woof of holy writ. Jesus' baptism fulfilled all righteousness in that it encapsulated all God's redemptive purposes manifested throughout scriptural history, but now brought to completion in his beloved Son, so as Jesus stepped into the Jordan, he was stepping onto the path that would end at the cross. And here, he would conquer chaos and darkness and death and bring us order and light and life. And unless we trust in what Jesus did for us, following him into those waters, our own lives will, will remain without form and empty. We will be on our own in this broken world. <laughs> That's daunting. There will be no one nor nothing to hold back the cosmic chaos that this sinful world is bound to bring into our lives. Jesus is willing to do that if we follow him into the water in, in, in the robust, full sense of all that that means. Thanks a lot. Is, what, a, what am I, three minutes? Close with prayer. All right. Thank you so much, y'all, for your attention. Appreciate it.